A few weeks ago, a small group of people emerged from a cave in southwest France with big smiles on their faces. They were met by a round of applause as they basked in the light while wearing special glasses to protect their eyes after spending so long in the dark. You see, this group had been underground in voluntary isolation for 40 days, part of an experiment to see how the absence of clocks and daylight and external communications would affect their sense of time. The project, called Deep Time, involved the 15 volunteers living in a cave where there was no natural light, the temperature was 10 degrees, and the relative humidity 100%. They had to get around using only the light of their headlamps. And for almost six weeks, they had no contact with the outside world, no updates on the pandemic, nor any communications with family or friends. As expected, they all completely lost their sense of time. One of the biggest surprises for them when they were brought out of the cave was finding that the full 40 days had actually passed. Several thought they had been underground for only 30 days, and one person was sure that they had been there for just 23 days. During those weeks, scientists monitored the 15 team members' sleep patterns, social interactions, and behavioral reactions using sensors. One sensor was a tiny thermometer inside a capsule that participants swallowed like a pill. It measured body temperature and transmitted data to a computer. The team members followed their own biological clocks to know when to wake up, when to go to sleep, when to eat. They counted their days not in hours, but in sleep cycles. Early on, the volunteers began to easily synchronize their patterns, though they found it tricky to organize group tasks without being able to set a time to meet. At the end of the study, two thirds of the participants expressed a desire to remain underground a little while longer to finish up work that they had started during their stay. One of the seven women in the experiment, Marina Lanson, said the experience was like pressing pause. She said she did not feel any rush to do anything and she wished she could have stayed in the cave a few days longer. Though once outside, she did admit she was happy to feel the wind and the bird song again. I think right about now at this point in the calendar, many of us may feel like some of those French volunteers slowly emerging from lockdown as the world around us begins to reopen, squinting our eyes against the bright light of day, and maybe not quite ready to give up all of the comforts of the cave. And like them, we may well feel completely discombobulated with our sense of time utterly upended. For so many of us, the usual markers of time from the routines that took us regularly out into the wider world to the special events that mark the passing of the year, they've all been largely absent or greatly altered by the pandemic. For myself, I find that my own sense of chronology is way off. The sequence of my memories is scrambled. What happened yesterday sometimes feels like it was months ago. And I have what feel like recent recollections of walking through Canadian Tire or sitting in my favorite Indian restaurant though I have not done either of those things since the winter of last year. And the unfolding of time across the days and the weeks has also just felt different. During this long ordeal, though there have definitely been periods that have felt tedious or tested my patience, I have also felt the time has flown by in ways that startle me a bit. I think this has had something to do with simply being able to be in the moment more often than seemed possible in the frenetic pace of the before times. One of the volunteers in the cave, Johann Francois, a math teacher and a sailing instructor who remarkably ran 10,000 meter circles in the cave each day to stay fit, said that he sometimes had visceral urges to leave. And I think almost all of us, even our most ardent introverts can appreciate that feeling. But he found without his usual obligations 
The challenge was, as he put it, to profit from the present moment without ever having to think about what will happen in one hour or in two hours. That, of course, is a teaching at the heart of so many of the world's religions, so much of what is learned through the hours of spiritual practice, to be fully present to the moment that we are in. It is no wonder that Marina Lasson, the woman I mentioned a moment ago, the one not quite ready for the experiment to end, she said she did not plan to look at her smartphone for several more days, hoping to avoid too brutal a return to real life. When we have known something of what it means to be present to the moment, even if imperfectly and even if only sporadically, it can be daunting to risk losing it, losing that sense of connection, losing our connection to the taproot that sustains us. My hope is that each of you through the strange twists and turns of the pandemic have somehow found that connection, that you've uncovered unexpected gifts, blessings, if you will, that you will try to hang on to even as life shifts toward our new and different normal. I invite you to take a moment now and reflect on what gifts you have taken from this time, what practices or ways of being that you want to carry with you into the future. Just take a moment. Our faith emboldens us with something of a paradox that because our days on this earth are numbered, our lives are an amazing time-limited gift to be cherished and lived to the fullest. But that paradox can also sometimes intimidate us, leaving us to question at the end of our days, not so much what comes next, but what has come before. As the UU Minister Forest Church so powerfully put it, in the end, we all want to live lives that are worth dying for. And that is why this month we are inviting you to think about time, the time of your life, and how you spend it. In memorial services I've often officiated, I've used the words from Robert Ingersoll, who wrote that before the sublime mystery of life and spirit, the mystery of infinite space and endless time, we stand in reverent awe. This much we know, he says, that we are at least one phase of the immortality of life. The mighty stream of life flows on, and in this mighty stream we too flow on, not lost, but each eternally significant. How might we spend our time? How might we live our lives if we truly recognize we are living out the precious bit of eternity that is given to each of us with every breath that we draw. It is the biggest question there is, and it's one I'll admit that I often ask of you. And I don't know about you, but I am not always satisfied with my own response. I too frequently forget that the meaning of life boils down to the meaning I make with my life and the meaning you make with yours. There are so many things to distract us from this life's most central task. Like many of you, I am at times completely overwhelmed by a sense of scarcity when it comes to time. But this isn't simply a matter of managing our calendars. It's that nagging existential element, the hard realization that this world offers more than you or I could or will ever see or taste or feel. There will never be enough time to do everything. Our time will eventually run out, and when it does, each and every one of us will leave behind books unread, art unseen, words unsaid, and work undone. And yet, the time we have can be enough. The challenge is to decide what makes our life's list and what doesn't to choose quite literally how we will use the time of our lives in the service of who we are and the things in which we most deeply believe. And hear me when I say this, this isn't about your to-do list or even your bucket list per se. 
It's as much or more about the quality of being as it is about anything you may accomplish. It's about being awake to your life, engaged in your relationships, and connected to the wells that nourish your soul. It is about being alive every day that you are alive. In that light, it's natural we may feel some regret, some disappointment for the time we've already whiled away across the years. As Alice Block's haunting words remind us, we sometimes say that we waste time, but what we are actually wasting in those moments is ourselves. And so it is that we might all do well to reflect on our relationship with time. Benjamin Franklin sternly warned us not to squander it, saying that time is the stuff that life is made of. And indeed it is the stuff in which we live and move and have our being and only for a while. As the composer Hector Berlioz so vividly, vividly put it, time is a great teacher, but unfortunately it kills all its pupils. But one of the best lessons that time has to teach is that it's ultimately the journey and not just the destination that matters. How many of us have fallen into the trap, the trap of feeling that your life is really going to start rolling along once you reach some important milestone or some distant goal on the horizon or once the pandemic is finally over. We think that when we get promoted or find a partner, when we hear back from the doctor, when the kids move out or when we retire, then and surely then we'll fully, finally start living our lives. But the truth, of course, is that all of the moments in between are our lives too. And if we miss living those moments with intention, with awareness, rather than anxious anticipation, we may well look back and decide we haven't really been as alive to our lives as we had thought or hoped. In his book, Time and the Soul, Jacob Needleman writes, It is this life that I wish to live, the same life I am living, but with one great difference, a difference in my experience of time. The fact is, he says, that I am not now living my life. It is living me. Needleman speaks to what seems, from what I know of your lives and my own, a fairly widespread experience. At this juncture, as we move towards a full return to life beyond the pandemic, we face a choice about how we will live going forward. We have a rare opportunity here, a time to pause, to reflect, and to carry on with intention the best of what we may have learned about ourselves over this pandemic, the practices or the ways of being that have helped us to have a better, firmer handle on life, the blessings that have helped us to feel connected to life. There's been a lot of talk about building back better. My hope is that this can be true for each of us. That, as Needleman suggests, we might more fully live into our lives rather than our lives living us. As this cautious but hopeful summer begins to unfold before us, my wish is that each of us may savor this changing season and consider anew what makes us truly come alive and then order our lives accordingly that we all might make the most of the time that is ours. So may it be. Blessed be.